Amen. Won't you stand up this morning? If you've got your Bibles, turn to James chapter 2. I want to jump right into our message today. We're doing a series called Life Hacks, and I was just going to tell you one today. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, my, my father used it. I've been laughed at before, but I don't like my shirts getting all wrinkled, okay? And when you have a stomach, like I do, my wife's pregnant, I look pregnant. It can get wrinkled in the car. So... I always hold my seatbelt out. I mean, I drive with my seatbelt held out in front of me, okay? I mean, I go down the road with my seatbelt around my thumb like this, riding down the road, real, real safe, because I don't want to get... So I learned a long time ago, you know those clips that you use for chips, to keep your chips fresh? If you'll take that clip and clip it onto your seatbelt... It will keep your seatbelt in your car way out, so no matter what size your stomach is, if it's big like mine or small, you don't have to worry about your seatbelt being too tight, and just pray that if you have a wreck that the clip breaks and that the seatbelt tightens back up and that you're safe. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I want you to please pray for us this week. We leave tomorrow. I'll be around in this area, but I'm actually preaching our junior high camp um, last Two weeks ago, well, the last couple weeks, I preached six times in eight days. This next week, between here and next Sunday, I'll preach ten times in eight days. And so just pray um, that we make much of Jesus, that he is glorified and lifted up. Thank you for your prayers for North Carolina. We saw kids radically saved. We saw kids give their heart to the Lord, surrender everything. There was this one tall, this big old strapping, good-looking young man. I thought he was an adult. I mean, he comes down for prayer. I'm thinking, man, one of the counselors got saved tonight. Praise the Lord. I mean, we're doing some stuff. Come to find out he's a 17-year-old guy. I mean, this big old guy. They played these games where they have, and we're going to get some of these because it was just so cool looking. They had these bubble things you get inside of. You just put it over you, and it's got handles inside, and you run and bump up against each other. And so they were playing soccer with that. So the goal was knock the other team down, kick the soccer ball into the goal. And this guy, he was just one of these gentle giants. He wasn't trying to be rude or anything. They just told him, knock the other team over. He's big. So he runs and he hits somebody, knocks him over. The other kid flips upside down. His feet are sticking straight up in the air out of this thing. And the other guy easily scores. And uh, anyway, I came to him later. I said, what you, what are you doing playing out there? He said, that's my team. I said, I thought you were an adult. He said, no, I'm 17. I said, okay, my bad. <laughs> but we also saw people gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit and just, I mean, the power of God poured out on these young people. And it was a powerful time. So this week, we're believing for the same thing. We'll be leaving tomorrow. We'll be in Oklahoma City, be close by. But uh, pray for us this week as we minister there. Amen. We are in, in Life Hacks, and we're looking at the book of James. And James is very practical. James is not the most fun book in the Bible because James confronts us. James convicts us. James deals with a lot of serious issues. And today, I want to look at a very famous passage of Scripture from James, chapter 2, verse 14. I want to break this down because it is, and you're going to have to let me teach a little bit with this, because it does get into some very serious things that literally there was people in hundreds of years ago that fought with Christianity over this, these verses here. So I'm going to talk about that this morning. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Will you hold your Bible up and repeat this after me? This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. 
I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. Look at your neighbor real quick and make sure their mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to be taught the indescribable, incorruptible, mountain moving, devil chasing, chain breaking word of God. In Jesus' name, I will never be the same. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that, Father, your word has all the life. Father, I have the privilege of standing and getting to minister, but the truth is, this is all about you. Without your anointing, nothing happens, but your anointing breaks every yoke of bondage that the enemy has tried to put on us and things we've allowed to happen in our life. It is your anointing that breaks the yoke. And Father, I pray for a fresh anointing on us today. Anoint our ears to hear. Lord, anoint our eyes to see and give us the courage and boldness to be the people of God that you have called us to be. We ask all these things in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody together said, Amen. Turn around and high five three people and say, faith without works is dead. And you may be seated. How many of you have ever heard this phrase, talk is cheap? Talk is cheap. Or how about this one, actions speak louder than what? Actions speak louder than words. Researchers, experts tell us this, that we communicate only 7% with our words, 35% with our tone of voice, and 58% with our actions. Any of you have that face that people can tell what you're saying without you even saying it? Look straight ahead, don't look at your spouse, you will be in trouble. Okay, like you have that face. It doesn't matter what I, I am. I, I get them. I tell them myself all the time up here, and I shouldn't. But there are times that maybe you know I don't know what's going on or something, or I don't. I, let me just. I'll just say it. I wasn't going to say this because y'all are going to try me afterwards. But there are times I don't know who people are, and because I meet people constantly, and I don't know who people are, and they'll come up to me and, and I, let me give you a good example. If in case this person's watching today, God bless you. But um, the other night we go to North Carolina. I mean, I'm a long ways from home. It took us a long time to get there, several days of driving. And I'm sitting there, and this lady comes up, and she's talking to me and another guy. So I'm just trying to be the nice person, southern gentleman you kind of thing. So I just say, hi, I'm Justin Blankenship. Nice to meet you. And she says, we're Facebook friends. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook. I don't know all of them, and I apologize. And come to find out, I mean, you know, she had commented on some posts and all this stuff, and she knows people here in Oklahoma, and her and her husband pastor, and, you know, she knew me, but honestly, but I had that face where it was like, you know, of course, my words gave it away there, but my face said, I have no clue. Even if I tried to act like I knew who she was, I had no clue. Sometimes my face can do that, because our actions many times speak louder than our words. Um, Here's the thing that James is doing. James is writing not to non-believers, but he's writing to believers. This is important for you to understand. He's writing not to non-Christians, he's writing to Christians. And he's writing specifically to Jewish Christians. And we know that because he says in James 1, to the 12 tribes that are dispersed, to the 12 tribes that are scattered everywhere, I am writing to you. So he's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered, and they are Christians, but they grew up in Jewish homes. And this is why this is important, because all their life they have been told, it is how you act that matters. You've got to follow the law. You've got to do all these things. You've got to follow a list. Here's what you're supposed to do. You do this, you can't do that. When I was in Israel when I was 18 years old, I noticed that on Sabbath, on Friday night at sundown till Saturday, we got in the elevator on a Friday night, and every it stopped on every floor and I got upset I mean you know I'm trying to get to my floor I'm staying a few you know uh, floors up and I'm tired I'm ready to get there and I thought some kid was running down floor to floor pushing the buttons and I'm thinking what kind of Brad is pushing all the buttons and I said why is it stopping on every floor and somebody said because to a Jewish person pushing the button of the elevator is work and you do not work on the Sabbath so their elevators are programmed to stop during the Sabbath on every single floor so they don't have to push a button 
We grew up, they grew up with understanding you got to do all these things. But then, all of a sudden, Christ comes and he dies, and Paul begins to preach about Christianity, and James, and Peter, and all these people begin to understand what it means to be saved by grace. That it is through faith we have been saved. It's not about my works that saved me, and they begin to preach this. But here's what happened. These people went from doing works all the time, to they went to the other side, and they weren't doing anything. They didn't care about about their actions they put their trust in Jesus and so they didn't care they just sat there and James is writing to these people and he said you misunderstood the point the point is not that faith and works are against each other it's not that you all of a sudden you were doing works and now you have faith and it doesn't matter James said you have missed the point and here's the problem many of you grew up the same way maybe you grew up in a church where you were beat over the head with religion and the Bible maybe you grew up in a church where people come Constantly, all you were taught was what you couldn't do. My famous line is that I felt like growing up, if it made you grin, it must be sin, okay? Maybe you grew up like that. Maybe you grew up believing that whatever you did, if you did anything fun, it was wrong. If you had too much fun, you were sinning. And so our churches used to preach like that. But then all of a sudden, we have gone to this grace side. And listen, I believe in the radical grace of God. I believe that God, that Jesus leaves the 99 to go find the one. I believe the grace of God is scandalous. I believe that God forgives people that I would never forgive. And he loves people that I don't even want to love because he is scandalous with his grace. I believe that. But if we're not careful, we get over here in grace and we act like it doesn't matter what we do because God's grace is there. Paul dealt with the same thing in Romans chapter 6. Look at what he said in Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, should we keep sinning just because we can? Grace is there. i got to get out of jail free card. I might as well just keep sinning. And look what he says next. Certainly not. Or some translations say, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? In other words, just because grace is available doesn't mean we, we should frustrate the grace of God and live however we want and say, oh well, God's grace is there. Oh well, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter anymore. And James is saying, no, that even though you are saved by grace, your actions still matter. Your actions are still, that it matters how you live and what you do. Can you say amen and help me tonight? And all of a sudden, we have church people that sit on a pew and they say, I'm doing my religious duty. I came to church on Sunday. Leave me alone. I went to church. I did the religious thing. I did what I was supposed to do. I believe in God. And you know what James says? You believe in God? Good job. A little golf clap for you. Good job. <laughs> the demons even believe. But they tremble. And you believe in God and you act like it's no big deal at all. And the demons believe in God, and they even tremble about believing in him. And I want you to know, just believing in God is not enough. Coming and sitting on a seat is not enough. Sitting here and thinking, just because you're here sitting down, that everything's good, and I'm a Christian, look at me, I'm sitting here. It is, no more, it is just as silly as you going sitting in your garage and thinking, because you sit there, you are a car, Okay? Just because you sit in a seat doesn't mean you are a Christian. Just because you believe in God does not mean you're a Christian. That we are called to understand what it means. And here's what James says. If somebody comes up to you and says, I'm hungry, and you know what you say to them? I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. Hey, you know what? I don't have any clothes. I'm naked. Well, here, let me, let me pray for you about that. You know what? Stop praying for them. I don't mean that bad. Some of you are going to say, oh. stop praying in that moment and go get them some food and give it to them. Go to the store and get them some clothes. Sharon's Thrift Store's got some good ones over there. Go to the store and get them some clothes and give it to them. And, and James is saying this, that you say all these things. You say you believe these things, but your life is not reflecting that. So I have three, three truths this morning. And truth number one is this, that godly faith produces action. Godly faith produces action action. This is a very controversial passage in scripture and here's the reason why. If you know anything about the Reformation, Martin Luther was the great reformer and Martin Luther helped bring reformation to the church and bring about what we call Protestantism or we were Protestants and it came through Martin Luther. 
And Martin Luther, had, he hated the book of James so much that he wanted the book of James thrown out of the Bible. He could not stand the book of James. Because Martin Luther's big thing was this, that we are saved by grace alone. It is by grace, by faith that we're saved. And we're not saved by works. And so he, he loved the book of Romans. Because Roman talks, Romans talks about that. He loves it. He loved that. But he hated the book of James. Because here's James saying, you show me your faith and I'll show you my work. And, and so some people act like those two things are against each other. It's either grace or it's works. It's one or the other. But I want to tell you this this morning. I believe we are saved not by works, but we are saved by grace. I don't have the scripture up there, but Ephesians 2 says this. It is by grace you have been saved. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we believe that you are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. You can't earn it. You can't can't buy it. You can't do anything, but all you can do is receive it. It is a gift from God. Amen? Yeah. But we stop there. If you read the next verse, but it says, but you were created. You are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You were not saved by works, but you were created to do good works. You were created to work for God. You were created to live for God. You were created to make a difference. You are here today. You are not here by accident. This week I will stand up with some kids that maybe in their mind thinks they're here by accident. And I will be able to look through those young kids in the eyes and tell them you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were created on purpose that God created you. And I want you to know today the same thing that God created you for a reason some of you God created and he said I will never do that again <laughs> but the truth is you were created on purpose and you were created with a destiny and a purpose but you were created not to sit here on a seat and just go to church and say look at me I did my religious duty you were created to make a difference you were created to love and to lead and to make a difference in your life and in your family and in our community. You were created for those things. And the two examples that James uses first is Abraham. I'm not going to get into this because I talked about this about two weeks ago. But James uses the idea of Abraham taking Isaac and sacrificing him or starting to sacrifice him. And he said that Abraham proved his faith. Because Abraham took Isaac and he said that what Abraham did, because of what he did, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. In other words, Abraham's actions proved that Abraham had faith. And then he uses, now that, that's not a scandalous illustration. Abraham's the father of many nations. The, the Jewish people hold him at the top, so that wasn't scandalous. But then he uses a pagan prostitute as an example. He uses Rahab. And he said, wasn't Rahab justified when all of a sudden Joshua sends in these people to spy out the land and they go to Jericho and what happens there in Jericho, that couple of guys are looking over it and trying to see what happens and Rahab hides these people, these spies in her house and she says to them, I believe your God is the greatest God. I believe your God is real. And how did she prove that? Because she allowed them to stay there. She took care of them and because Rahab believed in God, and because she did something about it, when the walls of Jericho come crashing down, Rahab and her family are saved. Because here is a pagan prostitute who didn't just say, I believe God exists. But she showed by her action that she believed God was the true God. And because of that, she helped save these people. Godly faith will produce action in your life. When you begin to realize, I believe in God. God is real. But not only do I believe he's real, that I believe he is called me to live for him he's called me to make a difference he has called me to begin to work for him can you say amen this morning and help me amen. truth number two we are known by our fruit Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 says this beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves you will know them by their fruits do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. We have a lot of people that go to churches every Sunday and they sit in seats every week 
but they go out of here and their lifestyle does not reflect what they say they believe. Let me ask you this, this question this morning. Let me say it to you this way, the best way I know how. Do people know you're a Christian because you have a bumper sticker that has a fish on it? Or because you have a Christian t-shirt on? Or does your actions reflect the God in which you say you believe in? And I believe the truth is this. If we are really the people that God has called us to be, then I believe all of a sudden we understand we will be known by our fruits. When I was in Mississippi, we were talking about boiling peanuts. For those of you who don't know what that is, um, you take green peanuts, jumbo ones. They have some here in town in Norman that are the small ones. But where I'm from, they have these jumbo green peanuts. And you boil them for about six hours in a bunch of salt water. And they come out and they're mushy. They have the texture of black-eyed peas. And they're salty and wonderful. And I mean, and this is like heaven to me. Just kidding. I love the way they taste. We have a guy in my church who's from Louisiana. His family's Cajun and he has an accent. And uh, when my mom was alive, he was trying to sell money to go to a mission trip to Africa. And so he came up and said, Miss Sharon, you want to buy some bald peanuts? She said, Willis, what is a bald peanut? And he goes, Miss Sharon, don't make fun of me. You want to buy a bald peanut? You know what a bald peanut is? He goes, she goes, Willis, I've never heard of a bald peanut in my life. He goes, Miss Sharon. And then she realized she really didn't know. He was saying boiled peanut, but because of his accent, it came out bald peanut. Okay? If you find anybody Cajun, just ask them to say toilet paper. They will say toilet paper, and it's really funny to hear that. Okay? But we were talking about this, and, I, and I'm not an agriculture person. Matter of fact, yesterday um, at Mr. Buddy and Glenda's house, I thought apples were on the ground. They were plums, okay? So I'm not the best when it comes to knowing fruit. But I do know that peanuts grow underground, okay? I'm not crazy enough or dumb enough, I guess I should say. To, I know where peanuts grow. So while I'm there in Mississippi, somebody said, hey, you want to go out and pluck some peanuts off the tree? You want to come out and get some off the stock? They're trying to make fun of me. I said, listen, I'm not that naive. I know where peanuts come from. They're underground. I get that. The truth is this, though. How you know what the tree is is because of the fruit that it bears. Yesterday, I realized in Buddy and Glenda's yard is a plum tree because they have plums on the ground. And I know what an apple tree is and what an orange tree is because of the fruit that comes out of that. And the thing is this, that, that the world is looking at us and they will know us by our fruit. And so here's what James says, faith without works is dead. And the illustration he uses is your body. He said, guess what? If all of a sudden your spirit leaves your body, if breath leaves your body, you're dead. You're laying there dead. You can't have a you can have a body, but it does nothing without having breath in it, without having life in it. So he said the same way, faith without works is dead. And so if you say you believe in God, then you should have the fruit of God in your life. You should have the fruit of the Holy Spirit being produced in your life. That your life Life should be evident of the power of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God. Do we get it right all the time? No, I understand that. But we are striving toward working toward him, to be like him, and allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit to come out of me. Listen, here's what I love about the fruit. Years ago, um, Brother Schaefer, Cameron and Rick's grandpa taught me this. Sorry, my microphone's messing up. But they he taught me this over here on a Wednesday night. He taught me this lesson. I never thought of it like this. If you ever go up to an apple tree, put your ear up to it, okay? I made this part up, actually. but um, and, and try to hear the apple tree. Just see if you hear it grunting, okay? See if you hear it going, ugh, trying to produce fruit. I'm not constipated. It's okay. <laughs> I'll just say it out loud, okay? I know what y'all are thinking. I'm that crazy preacher that just says whatever he's thinking, because I know I got crazy folks in the audience that are listening. To all those that are watching online, you can give to our ministry. Just kidding. <laughs> I have never seen an apple tree have to, to strain to produce fruit. It does it naturally. 
And here's the thing, when you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and to overflow, you don't have to try to produce the fruit in your life. The Holy Spirit produces the fruit. He is the one doing it. You don't have to sit over there and try to grunt and try to do all of this stuff to get the fruit of the Spirit to operate in your life. It is the Holy Spirit. It's His fruit, and He is the one doing it. All you've got to be is surrendered and say, okay, Lord, here I am. I am a willing vessel. Will you allow your fruit to be evident in my life? Will you help me? I was preaching there in North Carolina. Once again, you know me. I'll just say whatever. I'm trying to teach the kids this. I want you to be like Jesus. And some of them are driving. And I, and I say what I say around here sometimes. I'll say sometimes I'm riding down the road and somebody cuts me off and I want to wave at them. And if I'm not careful, I don't want to use all my fingers. And a little old lady sitting over here went oh, in the middle of church. I mean, I thought I had just said something so sacrilegious. But the point is this, that whenever we understand what it means to be like Christ, that godly fruit is being produced in us. And they know us by our fruit. And so James says, faith without works is dead. you got great faith. You say, i got all this faith. But guess what? You're sitting there talking about it. And talk is cheap. And you can talk about it all day long. You can say you believe in God. But you know what the Bible says? These signs shall follow them that believe. I believe that if we're serving God and doing what we're called to do, then we will be evident in our life. What will follow us will be signs. We will see people's lives change. We will see miracles take place. We will see people healed and set free. We will see the cat Captives let go. We will see things happen in people's life because those things follow us because of who we are, because how we live our life. The fruit of the Spirit and the, and the signs and wonders should follow our life. It should be a natural part of the believer's life. We should not be surprised every time God does something supernatural. We now listen. I'm not saying we just act like it's that it doesn't matter, but I think so many times it's amazing to me how excited we get when God answers prayers. Like you're surprised it happened. Didn't you pray and ask? And you're like, oh, wow, God did it. Guess what? He's God. And and, and it should be a part of our life. We should live naturally supernatural in the sense that everywhere I go, that I am living for Christ. I can lay hands on people in Walmart and see them healed and set free as as, as easy as I can do it right here on the front row. I can can talk to somebody at the, the gas station down here and see their life change as much as I can do it in church because everywhere we we go, that our actions should be that of the fruit of the Spirit being in operation in our life. Amen? And then thirdly is this. Your dreams need legs. Your dreams need legs. Joseph had some dreams. Joseph, I'm an only child, so I didn't have this problem, but Joseph dreamed about his brothers bowing down in front of him. If you've got brothers and sisters, how many of you know that probably won't go over very well if you tell them that? (laughs) He dreamed these things. But you know what? From the time he dreamed it until it came to pass, some things had to happen. And I believe God has placed dreams on the inside of some of you. God has put businesses on the inside of some of you that he wants you to start. God has put books on the inside of you he wants some of you to write. God has sermons on the inside of some of you that he wants you to preach. God has on the inside of you a ministry he wants you to launch. But you know what? Your dreams need legs. You can talk about it all day long. You can say, one of these days, I'll do that. One of these days, I'll start that ministry. One of these days, I'll start that business. One of these days, I'll make a difference. One of these days, and before you know it, when you you realize as you get older that time goes by quickly, and you wake up one day, and one of those days is about over with, and now you can't do it anymore if you wanted to because you had a dream, but you never allowed the dream to happen because your dream needs to have some legs. It's not just about talking about it, but it's time we step out in faith and do these things. It's time we try some things. It's time we say, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. If you've called me to do this, then I'm going to do it. It may just be me and my family at first, but we're going to do it. We're going to start this. You know how many ministries were started with just a couple people getting together, and now thousands of people's lives are being changed? You know how many businesses were started with one person just stepping out and saying, I'm going to try this. I want to try this thing. And now these people are, are, are blessed and blessing others because they took a step of 
faith. And I want to tell you today, God has placed things on the inside of you, but you need to do something about it. Faith without works is dead. And if he's calling you to do it, quit making excuses. Quit saying why you can't do it. So many times we allow the enemy to speak to us, and the enemy says you can't do it for that reason. I'll be honest with you, that's my personality. I am naturally a skeptical person. If you give me a, an issue, I will find every problem with why it won't work. I will find every problem why this will never happen. Because in my mind, I don't want to fail. My personality, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do it unless I can, get, I can overcome or I can be successful. That's how I am, okay? If I'm playing a game, I don't want to play it unless I know I have a chance to win. I have to watch my, per that's my personality, okay? I have to be careful with that because I can find every excuse in the book why this will never happen. But there are times we've got to put all those voices to bed and we've got to realize there's one voice that is greater than all those voices and it is the voice of your heavenly father who's telling you I have created you for this reason I have designed you for this purpose that I have put this in your heart for a reason that I have put eternity the Bible says God has placed eternity in our hearts and I believe part of that is one of these days in heaven but part of that is right now that God has put things for the future in our hearts that he wants to see us accomplish and God places it inside of us because he wants us to do it but it takes us doing the work to do it and so many times we make excuses I don't have time for that I don't have the money for that I, it'll never work nobody will buy into that it'll never happen and if you're not careful your dreams will die and there is a boneyard full of dreams that never made it to fruition simply because people didn't get up and try and I want to tell you this your dreams need legs it's time we stop talking about it and it's time we start doing it it's time we stop talking about the problem and it's time we, we become part of the solution the reason the hope centers in my heart is because I know there's a problem of an opioid addiction and an alcohol problem and drug abuse in our community. But guess what? We can sit here and gripe and I can get up and I can tell you the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Can you believe how bad the world is? Can you believe how bad things are? And I can get up and gripe all day long to you or we can become part of the solution and we can say we have hope and why not give hope to somebody else? We can sit here and gripe about all these things going on or we can be part of the solution and we can make a difference in somebody's life and God has placed it in your heart. Don't get upset that everybody else doesn't buy into it. God hasn't placed it in their heart. He's placed it in your heart. You do the dreams God has given you. You let the other people do the dreams God has given them and together we make up the body of Christ. We need hands to do one thing. We need feet to do one thing. Our ear needs to do something else. You stay in your lane and do what God has called you to do and you let other people do what God has called them to do and as we come together as one body we make a huge difference because we don't just sit by and talk about it but we actually get up and do something about it can you say amen, amen. well the worship team or the, the musicians come real quickly I'm going to end with this the problem is this the world's heard all of our excuses. Listen to me, folks. Whether you know this or not, we're part of a growing church here, and I'm thankful for that. But that's not true everywhere. The truth is, statistically, over the whole of the United States, church attendance and people believing in God is declining. I told you this recently, but we now have as many people in the United States who claim no religion. They're not, they're not agnostics, they're not atheists, they just claim no religion. We have the same amount of people, or more people, I believe it is, that claim no religion than claim to believe in God. Because we don't, listen, I don't know if you woke up and realized this yet, but this ain't May Mayberry any longer, okay? This ain't the days of the old-fashioned good old days. And by the way, we like to think of those as the good old days. They were only good for certain groups of people. It wasn't good for everybody. But let me just tell you this. We live in a society where the only way that we're going to see people's lives changed is if our actions and our words match up. They've heard it before. They've heard us say, Jesus loves you, but then we condemn them for everything that they do. They've heard us say, Jesus loves you and Jesus cares about you. They come in our churches 
and we reject them because they don't look like us, they don't act like us, they don't smell like us. So we tell them to leave. I told you this story before, but there was a man who came into a church and the only clothes he had to his name were torn up jeans. I don't mean the fashionable kind now. Torn up jeans and a dirty shirt. And he came in the back of the church and the preacher came up to him and said, son, we're glad you're here today. I want you to come back, but next time you come, would you dress a little better, please? The guy showed up the next service wearing the same thing, and the man said, Sir, I, I've asked you once, I want you to do this. I want you to go home, and I want you to pray, and I want you to ask Jesus what he wants you to wear to church next time we have church. So they leave, and the next service rolls around. The young man comes back in wearing the exact same thing. And the pastor went to him and said, Sir, we're, we're glad you're here, but I've asked you twice already. That's not really how we dress around here. I, th I thought I asked you to go ask Jesus what to wear here. And the guy said, I did. And the pastor said, really? What did Jesus tell you? And the, the man said, Jesus said he didn't know. He had never been in there before. And I want to tell you this. We can talk a big talk in church. We can say all these things. We can say we believe that God does miracles. We're going to be doing a series in July on miracles. Because I believe that God not only talks about it, that it happens. And we're going to see miracles happen right here. And the reason I say that is because we've talked about things for a long time. But it's time we stop talking about it and it's time we start living it. It's time we allow our actions and our words to match up. And we don't just say, I go to church so I can do my religious duty. But we say, I believe in Christ. And by that, we are saying, he is Lord of my life. He has changed me. He has transformed me. He has changed every part of me. That All I have, everything about me is under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I have given it to him. I have surrendered everything to him. And as we live that way and understand that, that we understand that our faith and our actions Actions matter that yes you are saved by grace you can't earn it you can't give enough but if you are living the life God has called you to live actions will follow and the actions will be godly actions of understanding who God is and how he works in our life that God created you for a reason that faith and works are not two different coins they are two sides of the same coin and it's simply I'm saved by faith but because of that my works do matter because what I do proves that God is at work in my life. Will you stand up?